All right, uh, we have a winner for the card. Nate, who in brackets has Mum's Cup, won. Where are you, Nate? Uh, oh, come on and get it, lad. Five bucks. You can get five donuts with this. It's not for you. You know, it's, it's church. You have to tell the truth. Really? It is for your mom? Oh, what a sweetie. He's a keeper. Don't send him off to private school. Hang on to that one. He's great. You know, we live in a kind of an interesting age because uh, for the first time in history, we, we probably have more time off than we ever had. Um, we have shorter work days and uh, accessible to us, uh, more vacation time, um, all those kind of things. But we never really um, have ever had a time when we've been as, as kind of stressed out consistently. Um, kind of, kind of a, uh, there's this constant um, kind of nagging feeling that we have. And, and this is killing us, it really is. Uh, stress can be tied to all kinds of things like the, um, the, our health, uh, our quality of life, our relationships, our career, um, our well-being, our parenting, our marriage. Um, all kinds of things are affected by how we handle stress. Now, a little bit of stress is a good thing. Actually, scientists have shown that stress is a great motivator to accomplish some things. Sometimes you have to listen to that little inner voice, like you know, when you're in the bathtub and you want to make toast. You, you have to listen to that inner voice and go, okay, maybe this isn't such a good idea, okay? So a little bit of stress is a good thing. The problem is right now, as scientists are monitoring it, there's two terms that have come up. One was added to the uh, Webster Dictionary 2013, the first one, the second one in 2010. The first one is called FOMO. Does anybody know what FOMO stands for? You ever heard that term? Okay, it's a, an acrostic for fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Uh, marketers in the 1990s uh, into, the, or sorry, into the last decade were calling our age the age of access, okay? It used to be before you could go, uh, you know, Justin Bieber, when's his birthday, right? Well, right now, I can, you know, if you knew that, that was an interesting piece of information. You could share those. And, hey, I know when Justin Bieber's birthday is. Now you just go on Google and go, when's Justin Bieber's birthday? And call it up. Oh, okay, cool. I got it, you know? And it's the age of access. So if you want anything, it's right there at your fingertips. Um, you don't have to go find a computer now. You can carry them around with you. Did anybody see the uh, release of the iWatch? Okay, is it just me or do we just get rid of our watches? Do we not? Like we got our phones, we got the time, we got all that kind of stuff on it. Like, like picture this, like who thought of this? People are gonna be walking around talking into their, you know, like you're gonna be walking into objects and all those kind of things. No, the, the thing has to be connected to your phone. So you need your phone anyways. And the question I have is why have the watch when you have to have your phone anyways? And this thing can do all kinds of things, phone calls and all that, you know, and, and all the thing you do. Apparently there's some of them that are made of, of gold that are cost up to $18,000 US. Imagine that with our dollar the way it is right now. That's about 300 million for us. Um, just to buy one of these things, an exorbitant amount of money. But, but we all about our tech. Fear of missing out has created, and the idea of the egg of, age of access has created this kind of, I don't want to be detached from others, okay? I don't want to turn my phone off. What if something bad happens to someone I love? They can get a hold of me. I have my phone on, right? Or I can't wait till the Avengers movie is coming out. The third trailer was played this week. I, I had a friend. He said, oh, yeah, I was at work. And uh, ding, third trailer's online. I immediately watched it, you know, and, and he's excited about the Avengers movie coming out. Um, we just don't want to miss out on anything. What happens if there's news? And you track this all the way back to the O.J. Simpson thing. You remember where everybody's watching TV and they're following the, the Bronco around on the highway and all that and the drama that it kind of uh, released in front of us or Princess Diana when she passed away in the tragic accident. We're glued to our TVs, 9-11. You know, we're just glued to our TVs as things happen and we don't want to miss these things out. And so we're constantly connected through our tech and this has created this no-mo thing, 
okay? And so we are always accessible, we are always connected. And, and some of the studies now are showing some crazy things. 58% of people don't go one waking hour without checking their phone. 59% of people check their emails it comes in. 89% of people check their email daily on vacation. Okay? 80% of sleep, uh, teenagers sleep with their phones. 84% people believe they couldn't go one day without their phones. Like the statistics are just absolutely crazy. And so we as people have this kind of connected. The second term is nomophobia. What is nomophobia? Does anybody know what that means? Hey, Michael? Fear of not having a phone. Yeah, fear of not having a phone with you, right? I remember, you know, and most of you can remember a time when your phone was something you had in your house and when you're eating dinner and rang, you ignored it, right? Not now. You know, now at any given time, you know, around our table, we can have all kinds of things going on, right? And people can get messages and all those kind of things. I, I, the, the Matt team, we were, we were talking about pastoral care a few years ago, and I got a cell phone, right? And it was amazing how quickly this little thing became so central into my scheduling and connecting and texting and pastoral care, and I love it. I love it because I can get you all anytime I want, right? I just text you, you know? And uh, I can be quite annoying at times I hear. But anyways, <laughs> like we have a number of young adult students uh, way at College University right now, and they will attest that Scott never goes away. You know, I text them, you know, how's this going on? How is this? Have you found a good church? Are you reading your Bible? All these kind of things. And I keep constantly in touch with them, which is kind of a good thing. What I find remarkable is you can text one of these college university students any time, day or night, and you get a message right back. Any time. Like, I don't think they sleep. I don't think they eat. I don't think they go out. I don't think they ever turn their phones off. You can get a hold of them any time you want. And this is created with us, this constant idea of being accessible and this constant fear of being disconnected. And, and they actually compare it right now to an addiction. Okay, there's, there's the kind of addictions you have to go find. And then there's kind of addictions that are all around you. Tech is an all around you kind of addiction. It's very similar, uh, people compare it to food addictions. Like in our culture of plenty, food is accessible all the time. You can go to Costco and have lunch without paying the cent, <laughs> right? And walk around, you go certain times, man, right before Christmas, you can have a banquet. And, and some of those ladies, if you, you mooch up to them really nice, they'll give you seconds. They will, and thirds. Um, I've, I've discovered this. I know which ones to hit and which ones you just better steer clear. Um, and you can go around and have food all the time. That's an addiction. So we can eat. And in fact, in North American culture, we are eating ourselves quite literally to death. It's all thing, kinds of things connected into that. But text the same way. Um, they're talking about, uh, I believe the city of New York now is Wi-Fi zone. The entire city is Wi-Fi. Uh, they're talking about it right now. It's in schools. It's in malls. It's in coffee shops. All those kind of things. Anywhere you go, there's Wi-Fi. And there's all these radioactive signals going around and, and, and buzzing through your head in the school's Wi-Fi. In fact, it's kind of hard to get away from it. I was absolutely shocked. I was somewhere um, when uh, I did a, a, a kind of a retreat with my family oh, early in February and we were out in Westport. No signal. And it's awesome until I realized that the cottage actually had Wi-Fi that I could sign in and actually access. But I had no signal, no cell signal, no nothing. It was kind of crazy. It drove me nuts for a couple hours and then I kind of realized that maybe it was a good thing and I read a book. But it's very rarely, it's the exception, you go somewhere right now and you don't have Wi-Fi and you don't have access to your phone. And this has caused us some harm. What do you think this kind of hurried plugged in lifestyle has done for us. Scotty, you got the mic, where are you about? What has this done for us that possibly has a negative effect? I've talked about the positive. Over here. Um, a, a good friend of mine does her, works online a lot, like it's her business, Yeah. and she cannot disconnect. Mm. Like the, people expect an answer right away, so she can't get, uh, away from her work. Or, or she people, loses customers. Yeah. Yes. They, it's like instant. They yeah. want it back. Just yeah, like you the said, expectations. Back that, yeah. Yep. 
all kinds of work, right? They, yeah. yeah. And this is stressful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very stressful. John. Just a note, there's a, a, a couple of restaurants in Toronto now that you actually put your phone in the middle of the table. Yep. And they're trying to get people to talk to each other. Have you ever seen people sitting across from each other and they're on their phones? Yes. And they don't even talk. But what yes. happens is they've actually done it now that if you, the yep. first one to pick up the phone yep. pays for the entire bill. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I think what happens is we're so connected we can't turn it off. And that's the problem because we, it's just We get normal. so used to it. Yeah. 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 That's true. Someone else said, yeah, you better give it back to them. Um, there's one over here, there's one here, one there, there's a couple there. When I got married, the pastor actually said that anyone that phone went off in the service that they would have to pay for the wedding, so it was a good chance. To <laughs> <laughs> That's a policy I have. It, it gives me a chance to double up the clergy fees and, uh, and also serve a, a good thing. Uh, Scotty Grace had her hand up too. He says, make it quick. <laughs> well, this may sound strange, but, you know, when you think about the Garden of Eden and what was God's desire to walk and talk with Adam and Eve, yeah. and then they got disconnected, right? Yeah, yeah. So then they started substituting, I think, other ways of meeting that communion that they were supposed to have. Yep. And um, I discovered this verse, I don't know if I told you this, but it's in Psalm um, 119. It says, seven times a day do I praise you, O Lord. Mm. And I start to try and do that, you know? Yeah. And I think that we're, we're supposed to be connected. We're supposed to have a flow between God and ourselves, spirit to spirit. Yeah. And how can he really get his channel in yeah. <laughs> if we're always tuned to another one? Always tuned to another one. That's good. That's good, Gracie. There was one over here. And then Cindy over here. Way the right side of the room is waking up. That's good. Okay, yeah. I think... Because we're always so constantly connected to everything all the time, um, we don't think deeply. Mm. We don't, we, and we don't communicate deeply with other people. But, but even just being alone with our own thoughts, and because we can access anything, anywhere about anything, to actually spend an amount of time and ponder something, yeah. and really mull it over in your head and, and, and chew on it and meditate on it and just kind of get to the bottom of something and what you think or feel about something or a circumstance or an issue or whatever. I just think we're just so, everything's quick, 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 quick. And we've, we've lost that ability to really be deep yeah. Um, yeah. in our thinking. And I wonder sometimes, does that follow through then that sometimes we are maybe not as deep people as we would like to be? And yeah. is this part of the reason why? We're very surfacey. Yeah, that's good. That's good, Cindy. Tech is expensive. I just had to buy my first phone. I've always won them or... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're like Mrs. Contest, aren't things. you? Yeah. And then you have to work more hours to pay for being able to buy the things that you're trying to use to save time. Yeah. You know what? Mm -hmm. What you have to say is very expensive. Very important, but how many people want to set a lottery pool up with Cindy? <laughs> oh, is that right? It's got to be a free contest. Okay, well, that's too bad. Michael, that was good, Cindy. Uh, someone else brought up time with God, and on a similar note, it's much harder to get me time. Um, mm, yeah. It's, it's very hard to sit down and say, I'm going to spend two hours on me Yeah. when all of a sudden your phone beeps. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in the old days when you had a house phone, it didn't ring every 14 seconds. No. It did ring. Unless you have teenagers. Well, even then. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. one of them would answer the phone and be on it for three hours, and then yeah. it wouldn't ring anymore for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Because they ignored call waiting. Yeah. Yeah. But now every single person in the house has a beep every 30 seconds. Wow. You know, it's just... I know in my house, there's... When I'm home and Cindy's gone to work and she's left her tablet at home... Yeah. It beeps every time she's getting a message. Yep. Even though she's not there. And mine's beeping every time I'm getting a message. And my daughter's is beeping every time hers is getting a message. Wow. That's crazy. It is. And it, you're absolutely right. And you know what? Can I put the other side of that coin too? Is it's hard for us to get me time because we're so used to being plugged in. As soon as we sit down and start to ruminate for a second, we go, oh, I wonder how so-and-so is doing. And so we pull our tech out. And we look too, so it has kind of a two-sided two coin. Mike, uh, yes, um, please, Joanna. I think 
Uh, it's added a whole dimension to parenting. I don't think we've mentioned this, but we yes. are new at the rules, and yes. and our and it just is one more thing that becomes a battle, because the kids view it as one thing and we view it as another thing. Yeah. And and the things that we used to take for granted, like talking in the car to have yeah. some communication time, yeah. no longer happens. Yes. And, um, there's. I, it worries me the battle of where you draw your lines and then where you want to make it that they still communicate. Yes. Um, and, and you know what? That's a huge one. Most teenagers would rather be flailed alive than lose their tech. Right? Yeah. 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 There's actually a study that shows that one in five people said they would rather go a week without shoes than go without their phone. Anybody? Someone else over here. Yes. Okay, I'm technology stupid, so I don't have any of this stuff. Good for you. But working in retail, I get annoyed when the customer tells me what they want yes. and then completely ignores me for the rest of the time because they're either texting they're on or their talking. Phone. Yeah. I yeah. think that's uh, the reason why I don't want to get yeah. Yeah. plugged in. And you're being replaced by solitaire or candy crush, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. One more. John? And then Nancy, I want to hear what she has to say. Okay, she, just real quick. Um, yeah. Years ago, we'd get together with friends and we'd sit and socialize and talk about things that were coming up or things that happened. Yes. Now, with, well, our kids have already, like, they've got a huge network of cousins and they already know, like, five minutes after it happened. When a baby's born. Yes. How long does it take to go through the internet where it would be special to come out on church, Sunday, Monday, Sunday morning and see the new baby? Yes. They already know the weight, the size, the name, and everything else. Yes. Within like four minutes after the baby's born. Just, well, that's just it. Like we got up and announced it today. And how many people knew Tyler and Ayla had their baby before me? Yeah, like a whole bunch of you. Okay. I, you know, it's a fluke. I was texting Tyler about some upcoming youth events in the spring. And he said, oh, by the way, I won't be there Sunday. So I said, okay, well, you know, what's happening? Oh, we had the baby. You think he would have led with that? <laughs> okay, what'd you have? I got the name out of him, but you didn't get the weight. Men are useless when it comes to babies. Nancy. Well, just to tag on to Krista's, um, something just came out recently about our, the smartphones making people dumber. Because yes. you don't have to research. You can just yes. look it up, that instant yep. fact or whatever, and you, you don't have to be the deep thinker. You can just, so it's dumbing people down. And it is, know, it really is. Being able to plagiarize now is something that drives college and universities crazy because how do you manage it? Like, how do you tell if something's plagiarized or not? I mean, sometimes you can talk to the person and their vocabulary would give away that whoever wrote this paper was not the same person, right? Yes, Bradley. Um, I sometimes observe uh, that as a society, we would sooner talk than listen. And it seems like texting feeds into that, where mm. if I have a thought that I want to get rid of or tell somebody, I can do that immediately. Yes. But I don't have to necessarily even pay attention to what other people are saying. I don't have to be patient. I don't have to listen. I don't have to listen to the... Um, I mean, in psychotherapy, we learned that the music of what people say is far more important than the content. So we've got rid of the most important part of conversation. Uh, and, and so I'm not listening to the, the music of somebody. I'm just looking at the words, and I have the ability to just delete it anyway. Yes. And so I see a lot of people doing a yeah. lot of texting, but not really practicing learning how to listen. Yeah. And this affects us when it comes to relationships, conflict resolution, um, interacting, like, like, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but the number of guys and girls that split up over text now is shocking. Yeah, absolutely shocking. But the positive side is those, if you want to meet somebody, you don't have to go to a bar anymore. You can go online. There's all kinds of dating websites, and you can, you can meet an axe murderer that way. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can connect with people you never had the access. So there's positives and negatives to doing that. I'm going to move on because I, I just want to go a couple of verses. First of all, as a follower of Jesus Christ, one of the things we enjoy is freedom. Freedom. Um, it, this is a, a funny kind of balance to, to teach, but... But when I became a follower of Jesus Christ, you, you know how you say the rules don't apply to you? There, there are a lot of little legalistic things that you're free from, okay? Free from. Like, like 
yeah, I, don't, I grew up in, in, in a church that was uh, called a holiness church, and, and it, it went you know, from what you watched to what you wore to how you looked to how short your hair was, you know, to all those kind of things. It was just a, kind of the norm I grew up in. Um, and it, it was a shock to me later when I realized, and I studied the Gospels and everything, that Jesus had long hair, facial hair, um, hung around riffraff. He did all the things I was told not to do. Right? And I kind of go, well, why was that? You know? I remember one guy trying to tell me, Jesus didn't drink wine, it was grape juice. You know, kind of thing. Give me a break. Um, just people trying to justify things. And I, I, I remember just, you know, there was all these rules, and then I realized that in Christ there is freedom. Now, there's not freedom to go out and sin. Okay? The Bible's pretty clear on stuff that's sin, okay? Sexual immorality, drunkenness, violence, fits of anger, you know, colorful metaphors and poor, you know, things like that. All, the, all these kind of things of Scripture say stay away from that stuff. But there's freedom, which means all of a sudden I can go, okay, uh, my dress to God is immaterial. What is important is the condition of my heart. Okay, now with my dress, I can be saying, "Look at me," and and you know, um, I can try to be you know connecting with the opposite sex. Don't laugh. There was a time when I had a beautiful body, um, and and you could use those kind of things for which is not that's not godly behavior. But what I mean by that is God doesn't care whether I wear blue or brown or whether I have buttons or you know the zipper or anything like that. All the stuff I thought God cared about, actually, He didn't care much about. What he wanted was a condition of my heart. So I have this freedom in Christ. But there's this other side to it, which is a very positive thing. With that freedom becomes what Paul calls not being mastered by anything. So all of a sudden, I yes, I have access. Tech is not sinful. Technology is not sinful. It's not wrong to have a cell phone. It's not wrong to text. It's not wrong to text a certain amount. It's not wrong, any of those kind of things. The question is, is what masters you? And if you want to know whether something masters you or not, give the thing, give your phone to someone and say, I don't want it for a week, and see how freaked out you get. Okay? Hand your wallet to a stranger and say, go around the block, and I'll meet you back here, and you'll see how much money means to you. Right? Or credit cards or... Those kind of things. These kind of things, they become our masters. And when they become our masters, we become slaves. And a follower of Jesus Christ is only a slave to one thing. And that is the law of love. We are slaves to Jesus Christ, which means we are so in love with him that the first question we ask of anything is, do I love Jesus enough to give this up? Do I love Jesus enough to put this in its place? Do I love Jesus enough to follow him? Do I love Jesus enough to look foolish? Do I love Jesus enough to stop sinning? Do I love Jesus enough to talk to him every day? Do I have Jesus enough to study his life? Do I love Jesus enough? Those, that, that's what we're a slave to. And we're slaves to that because we choose to be. But Paul wrote, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so... The writer of Hebrews, who I believe is Apollos, went on to write, and you probably saw it in my email this week, so there's a special rest still waiting for people of God, for all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our better, best to enter the rest. Hebrews 4, 9 to 11. And uh, St. Augustine, Christian writer, 300 AD, wrote, We have made us for yourself, O Lord. Our soul is restless till it finds rest in you. And Jesus himself, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I, two things I want you to notice. There is a special rest, Paul wrote. And Jesus said, I will give you rest. There's something about being a follower of Christ that we have access to something that we didn't when we weren't followers of Christ. Okay? This rest that God is talking about is special. It's unique. It's different. And so the question is, what is it and how do I get it? Right? 
That's what we all want to know. Because I think all of us here would identify with, there's times where it's good to get off the, the ramp. It's time to, to get off this restlessness. There's time to de-stress. I need to be able to do that. Now, I have to say, in Peterborough, we're much better than this than the town I grew up in. I grew up in Oakville, Ontario. Oakville, Ontario is the type of place that you'll go out in the morning and put five resumes out, and by the time you get home, there will be three calls for interviews. You could always get a job in Oakville. There's so much money in Oakville. There's so much employment, and you make really good money. And so it's a driven community with lots of money and lots of jobs and all that kind of thing. So I experienced in the 80s what I, we haven't seen in Peterborough till recently was this rush, 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 rush. And I remember telling my wife um, just about my church. I said, I, I love my hometown. I mean, you could, anything you want, you can get it 24 hours. But I said, sometimes it's hard to talk to people. She says, ah, oh, you just, you know, whatever. No, you just, you know. And it was a broader home, and, and we ran into some friends of mine. And uh, they came up, and they said, hi. I said, hi, how are you? Fine. What have you been up to? Not much. Is anything new? No. Nope. And they just look at you and smile. I was absolutely shocked, and it's not everybody in Oakville, okay? There's lots of nice, deep people, and I, I appreciate British people in Oakville especially. They're the ones you can have a conversation with. But I came up to Peterborough, and someone would stop, and they would look at you, and they'd ask you how they are, and they'd lean against the building, and they would talk. And I was like, who are these freaks? <laughs> so this community has some bonuses that way that... For me, we're a real learning experience. I, I, I tell people, I tell Peterborough Breeze, it really does. There are times during this, the year in Peterborough where the whole city just slows down and it gets quiet. And I love that about Peterborough. But many of us now are on this hurried thing. So how do I get it and what does it look like? First thing, and this is uh, not rocket science, but I'll, I'll go by it anyways. The first thing is the idea of being still. The psalmist writes, be still and know that I am God. What does it mean, the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun, the writer of Ecclesiastes wrote, all his days work pain and grief, even as night his mind does not rest. You see, that the studies have shown that this level of stress that we have actually works counter to what we want to accomplish. People are less productive. They have horrible relationships, they tend to be short with people, they run into the trap of what they call the three F's, frantic, frazzled, and frenzied. They get toxic stress, they burn up energy rapidly and wastefully, and we do bad work, lose friends, lose clients. It's bad for you in every measurable way because we don't know how to stop. Can I teach you just a couple little things on the be still thing, okay? To be still means there are times in your day and there should be times in your week and times in your year where you are inaccessible. Nobody can get you. Okay? People say, oh, well, Jesus was accessible. No, he wasn't. Jesus was approachable, not accessible. Okay? Okay? What I mean by that is if Jesus was there, and this is how we need to be, and you see somebody, or they call you, you give them your full attention. Okay? So, as you were talking about in retail, Christine, um, when you're at the bank, when you're at the post office, when you're in the checkout line, all these kind of things, the, the temptation is to multitask with your phone. But the question is, and I've, I've done it myself, is to not treat the person as a person. And rare is a person that actually focuses on a person, how are you, and ask question, and talk about something other than the, the weather and the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> to be able to, yeah, it's funny, huh? <laughs> Next year they're gonna win the Stanley Cup, I have a feeling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> th there's this, this difference. Jesus at times got away from everybody. I remember one time he's with his disciples, this big crowd of people, and the disciples say, oh, it's exciting and everything. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm going over here. Gets in a boat and leaves. He abandoned the crowd. Other times he disappeared. And he went to be with his father. Where he went was quiet enough that he could hear God. 
Do you want to hear God when you're in frenzy and stressed out? You have to tune yourself to his voice in times of solitude. Okay? And you do that by doing nothing. You say, oh, that sounds boring. No, it's not boring. It's not, it's, 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 it's the idea of being comfortable with solitude and silence long enough that we start to breathe in. Um, Krista was talking about how this kind of rapid thing affects us. Fast food. You know a lot of North Americans are shallow breathers. Did you know that? We breathe up in our lungs. We don't breathe down in our diaphragm. And this actually has all kinds of health ramifications, uh, energy level, all those kind of things. If you breathe properly and drink lots of water, you will increase your energy level. Incredible. You can have a walk once a day. Those three things. And you will affect your lifespan, your health, your well-being, all those kind of things. Breathing down your diaphragm. I remember I took singing lessons when I was training in ministry because they want us to be worship leaders as well. I took singing lessons with this guy. He put his fist right here and said, push. And it was so uncomfortable. He says, yeah, you're a shallow breather. That's why you can't sing. He said, breathe, breathe down in here. And he taught me to push out. Take deep breaths, and the oxygen would get to your brain and would enable you to sing better and, and do all kinds of things. S singers who project come from their diaphragm. This is the same thing that happens for us when we're in solitude. Jesus often went and was alone. He was alone with God. He spent time with him. The psalmist wrote, but I've stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child within me. The idea of quiet. I remember we had a friend named Val, and, and Val had a dog named Morgan. Morgan was a golden retriever. He's huge. He was a big golden retriever. I'm sure there was some great Dane in him. Anyways, one thing that Morgan liked to do was sit on Val's lap when he was a puppy. Well, Val's about this tall, and he had this dog about this tall. And he still wanted to sit on her lap, but it didn't work, right? Because he was as big as a house. So what he used to do is he'd back up and put his bum up on her seat and stand with his paws out. And he'd stay like that for a long time. It was the funniest looking thing. This little wee girl with this huge dog's lap, you know, sitting on her lap with his paws sticking out looking, you know, like this. It was hilarious. But, but he was content. He was happy when he did that. He was trying to connect. This same kind of connection we can have with God, but it starts in solitude. It starts in silence. It starts with letting go. It's a trust thing. And the reason I've, I'm taking two weeks to do this, because I want to, there's some stuff I want to teach next week. But the second part is make a plan. The writer says, let us work hard to enter this rest. Okay? You say, oh, no, you're giving me more to do. Actually, there are two aspects to this plan. There is the offensive and the defensive. The defensive are things you do to disconnect yourself from stress. So there are things you do without. Does anybody want to give me some ideas of some defensive things they can do to, to avoid rest? What do you think? What are some defensive things we can do? I'll start with a, an example. Turn your phone off during the meal. All right, a simple one. Yes, Scotty. Take a day off work. Take a day off work, right? Some of you have banked all kinds of vacation time or whatever. Take a day away. It's another one. When you have your small group, turn your phone off. Turn your phones off. Do the phone in the middle of the table thing that John was suggesting. Anybody that phone goes off, you know, has to host a small group next time. Michael. Don't plan other work for the days that you took off work. Don't plan other work for the days you took off work. Yeah, Pierce, you hear that? <laughs> How's that sinking in? There should be pockets of time where we are not connected and we are not committed. Okay? Now, I find... A lot of my buddy friends are pretty good at this stuff. You know, we fish or golf, which require about as much brain activity as a fruit fly needs, right? Fishing. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's just nothing to it. But guy, you know, as a, my guy friends, we really love that stuff. 
So, so for some of us, it's hard to do that. Others, it's, a, it's, it's maybe something. But, but the idea of being still is not replacing work with work or activity with activity. It is replacing the stress with a quiet heart, a cool heart. Okay? Something else, defense. Turn your phone off at night. Turn your, shut your computer down. Here's a tough one. You work and you carry a cell phone and it's connected with work, leave it with assistant for a week. Let it keep them up all night. They'll love you for it. No social media when you're on vacation. For Lent, give up your iPad for a month. <laughs> yeah, giggling. <laughs> I'll never do that. But here's a question, why not? Why not? What will happen if you had a 24-hour period where nobody could get you? Oh, something bad could happen. Yeah. You know what? If they want you bad enough, they'll find you. They really will. There should be times we're disconnected. And then the offensive. The offensive is to be deliberate Okay, so that's making a daily Bible reading. That's making five minutes of solitude a day where we just go and sit. Here's a question. This afternoon when you go home and you're done lunch, how comfortable are you with going, sitting on your couch, not turning anything on and sitting for 20 minutes and doing nothing? If you find you're twitching and rammy and all that, part of it might be the coffee, but part of it might be you are not connected to God. And you are not connected enough. You are addicted to activity. A consistent prayer time. Time to worship. Where you maybe turn some on, but it's a worship song. And you just focus on God. Go outside and watch the sunset. Go for walks. Walks are incredibly good for you. And they're good for your soul. I used to always walk with headphones. I don't anymore. When I walk, I get more quality prayer time when I walk than just about any other time. What is your defensive plan? What's your offensive plan? I'm gonna leave you with that because we're running out of time here and I've, uh, we've got more to cover next week. So here's the three questions. On a scale of one to 10, how addicted are we to our technology and why? What is a good defensive plan for you and those who you love to overcome and prevent the addiction to technology? What's a good offensive plan? to seek God first in your place. I uh, passed around some green sheets. I don't know if you got a whole one. If you want, I can send some out this week. But I want you to take your homework this week is to take the green piece of paper and you, don't, you can read it and study it, but what I'd love you to do is just use it as a reminder that every time you see it, you gotta stop for a minute. And breathe deep and relax. Are you connecting with this? Okay, so there needs to be times you do this, but don't just expect it to happen. Make it happen. Defensive things and offensive things, things you need to do. I'm gonna ask the basket people to come around. They're gonna pass the outies and innies in. The outies are the ones that stuff comes out of. The innies are the ones stuff goes in. Um, if you're a guest here today, we'd love to just put you on our email list. So feel free to fill it in and, uh, and uh, we'll make sure to put you on it. Nance, I got your second email I got in this week. Did you get the email on the other, the, the one I sent out this week? You no know idea? Okay. You don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? It came to you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. right, that's good. You know, and some people are practicing what we preach here today. They slept right through this message. It's awesome. <laughs> While the baskets go around, I have some quotes, and then we'll close. But like I said, take the green sheet home and do this stuff for homework. Let's see what uh, God wants to say.
So next week's part two, we're going to be talking, first of all, about our work. Because I think part of the reason we have a hard time resting is because we do not have a scriptural understanding of work. And then we're going to talk about trust. We're going to talk about the kind of trust that makes a lot of the things that we use tech to monitor and that unnecessary, really, to us in a lot of ways. And it gives us an opportunity. Remember, Paul said, I will not be mastered by anything. I'm free. Everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial, he wrote. So this we will learn. So this week, find pockets of time to be still. And sit down and go, what are a few things I can turn off that will enable me to do that? And what are some things I can deliberately do that are going to help me out with that? Okay? Go in that like-mindedness. May God be with you. May he give you true rest, the special rest that God offers. May he bring to your mind the things we've talked about today, and may you find that rest and peace and freedom in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.